Hello everyone. Last time we talked a bit about meditation studies, the effects of karma, choices uh, and actions, and how all those terms relate to each other. Then we try to understand what the term Dhamma even means, as it is also in the title of the, of the lecture. And we also tried to understand what it means to access the nature of all things. Uh, in case that those things are not present anymore, you can always rewatch the last lecture. This time we want to start with knowledge about the observer and non-self. And as you might know, non-self is one of the central paradigms and the central teachings of the Buddha that sets himself apart, his teaching, his religion apart from all other religions or philosophies or however you want to call it. It's not necessary to call Buddhism a religion if, you, uh, if it goes against the, the grain of your, of your current moods or your current uh, inclination. You can also call it a philosophy, but it's a very practical philosophy. It's not just love for wisdom, which is, which is what philosoph philosophy is. It's uh, the implementation of wisdom. It's actually achieving wisdom and not just loving wisdom and trying to find truth, but to live truth, to be truth, <laughs> to actually be free from suffering. While all other religions also offer some paths when it comes to virtue, uh, I'm very much convinced that Buddhism is, is rather unique with its teachings on, on non-self. But anyway, we will find that out sooner or later at least in chapter 6, where we try to talk about wisdom and how to attain it and what it even means. This time, however, we want to start with modeling humans trying to find out what humans even are, because our idea of what a human is, is rather flawed when it comes to, to the Buddhist understanding. But one observation is very clear, at least in science, we don't really know how to model humans properly. They are incredibly complex systems. The human mind is probably the most complex thing in existence, uh, at least the most complex thing that we know, and it's a rather impossible task. But what we can say and what we can observe is, at least from a Buddhist perspective, that humans have little control over their actions and choices. Uh, this is something that we, that we can observe uh, everywhere in everyday life. So whenever we do something, we rationalize afterwards why we did it, and we, don't really, uh, we aren't really aware of our choices uh, in the given moment. In, in fact, most of our behavior is reactionary. Mainly, uh, namely, there is a feeling and some sense inputs from the environment uh, around us, and we pretty much automatically decide based on that feeling on what we should do. If there are pleasant sense contacts, then we usually have a good feeling uh, related to the prospect of having more of that. So our sense of self, our sense of control, our entire striving is directed towards uh, getting more of the good feeling or getting rid of a bad feeling or trying to distract ourselves from boredom or neutral feelings where there is nothing felt actively, which is very hard to discern, <laughs> by the way. And uh, one other observation, which I also uh, referenced here, uh, we will come to the references later, is that even modern science can pretty much observe that actions are determined before they become conscious. So we make our choices, our mind or our brain or however you want to call it. I would not say that uh, all the choices are just based on the brain. <laughs> it's the entirety of, of our being, mind, body or however you want to call it. All those choices are already made in a sense before they become conscious. First we go for something, first we decide that we want something, and then we become conscious of that. And mindfulness, which is a very important concept in Buddhism, makes this process visible. We want to become aware of our intentions, aware of our choices, aware of our actions, and aware of all the, the things that we are doing. And we want to be able to influence the process at the very level of wanting or liking, or whatever you want to call it. We cannot really change our feelings, how we feel, but we can change our attitude towards feelings. And in essence, humans are the sum of habits of wanting, not wanting, and ignoring. So that's a very good way to go about modeling humans. And if you can't clearly see this yet, you must first cultivate very beneficial habits. And this is what is typically designated as the training in virtue when it comes to Buddhism, where we try to train ourselves in emotional non-reactivity. We don't just want to be forced to react or act in a certain way when there is a presence of a bad feeling. We want to have a choice. But for most people, the presence of the bad feeling automatically means craving and automatically means acting out of that bad feeling. This is why it's so hard to model humans. Yet we have a choice. We can act differently. It does not have to be that way. 
And to see the truth of all of this, uh, we can perform a short or small partner experiment. And I would really invite you to, to do that with a person that is uh, maybe around you. And uh, to get an intuitive understanding of what the Buddha meant with this term non-self or anatta, we can perform such a partner experiment. And uh, it goes as follows. And again, I invite you to only read the second paragraph after I'm finished with the description so that you can pour, perform the experiment without being spoiled. And what you do is the one of you, one, one person of you, tries to speak out loud everything that person do, uh, does, but before actually doing it. So you want to label something out loud, what you are about to do, what action you are about to perform before you do it. If you are in control, you should be surely the master and controller of all of this. And it should be possible to do that. And the partner observes that performance for a minute or so, or five minutes, and writes down all the things that the first person also does, everything. And after five minutes, you switch roles and you evaluate the entire performance afterwards. Sit together and see what also happened. And now a short pause so you can actually perform the experiment if you wish to get a very good intuitive understanding of all of this. But in essence, <laughs> what you will discover, and I have absolutely no doubt about that, is that the meaning of non-self should be much clearer by now. If you seriously tried, you will very well be amazed by the amount of involuntary movements and actions. In fact, most of what we do in everyday life is completely involuntary. It just happens. And if we are lucky, we become conscious of it. But uh, that is, uh, well, only part of the truth. It just helps you to get an intu intuitive understanding. And there's even a lot of research on the term non-self, uh, and it's important to understand what, what is even meant by, by the term self um, when we try to understand what non-self is. And the Buddha equates self with control, with ownership, and with externalness. So it's, it's not too easy to understand what he meant by it, uh, but the primary characteristic of a self is that it feels like we are controlling certain things. And the experiment we just did uh, kind of contradicts that sense of control. And what we control, control is what we own. And uh, well, from, from all of this, there also arises a sense of externalness. It feels like we are watching from behind our eyes. Everything out there that is not behind our eyes is that. And everything inside is this. This is us. This is ourself. So this is what is usually meant as self, at least in the Buddhist context. Other people can mean different things when they talk about self, but it's important to have a clear understanding of the vocabulary, how I use it in this lecture. And in essence, there is much, much research on, on consciousness, for example, by Susan Blackmore or other authors like uh, Robert Wright, who wrote the book Why Buddhism is True, who also highlights this automatic behavior based on feelings. But uh, the, the gist of all of this is that the mind automatically reacts to good and bad moods or feelings. And each feeling or mood is a different mode of operation. At least that's uh, how Robert Wright tries to portray it. And it's true in a sense. Whenever the feeling is different, our behavior is different. But we can't control how we feel. There will always be a feeling, that is very true, but uh, the quality of the feeling, if, it's a, if it is a good feeling or if it is a bad feeling or if it is a neutral feeling, that is something that we cannot even conceive uh, to control. We always try to make the feeling different. Our entire striving is directed towards that. So if we could really control that feeling directly, we would surely do that and exclusively experience good feelings. That is uh, an example that the Buddha often gave to those who questioned or debated him. And it is true. Most of our striving is directed towards finding sexual partners, uh, watching Netflix series, eating tasty food, uh, experiencing nice things that we can remember so that we can relish those memories. But what all of those things have in common is that we try to change the situation so that we experience something nice. This is the gist of all of it. And all of human striving is directed towards it. The majority of it is directed towards finding a sexual partner. <laughs> that is uh, also true. But there are also other kinds of, of good feelings that many other, other people also try to, to seek. Because not everyone is either capable or willing to, to seek out a sexual partner. And uh, evolutionary, that was kind of useful. It was a very fast heuristic that we could base our decisions on. Because of the speed of the decision, it was often necessary to survive. 
because uh, well fast decision making is crucial when uh, a, a large cat or, or wolf attacks us we don't have the time to think and evaluate and ponder the situation we must decide fast that it's time to run or time to fight or anything like that so feelings are very effective at what they try to do namely at making us survive but they do malfunction nowadays quite a lot because we are not living in the same environment anymore in fact the environment changed so fast compared to the past that a lot of our programming is not suitable anymore it's not beneficial in many situations and thus we suffer greatly from our feelings and brain scans uh, as a as an example can reveal our actions and intentions in advance. So uh, a certain area of the brain is active when it comes to deciding, for example, way before we become conscious of our decisions. So we can, uh, if we go by brain scans, uh, see seconds in advance before we become conscious of our choice that we will go for, I don't know, uh, go go get some some pizza or some food or anything like that and this is rather unsettling for many people <laughs> because it uh, seems to undermine our our sense of free will of our, our sense of choice which is not really the case it's just uh, that the sense of choice is it's rather different from how we think about it that's uh, by the way a concept or an idea that we will encounter frequently during this lecture it's not so much that uh, something is entirely uh, that, that something vanishes or that something has to go or that something is completely wrong. It's more that we have a wrong understanding of things. We don't fully know what humans are. We don't fully know what feelings are. We don't know, fully know what self is. And we don't really, really understand that correctly. So what we think of as humans, what we think of as self, what we think of as feelings, that changes. It's not so much that, that reality changes. Reality was always the same and will always be the same. Uh, but our interpretation of it, that can change. Our understanding of it, that can change very much. And humans, uh, in essence, assume a sense of self and a sense of control because we are always there. We are always in the center of the stage. So uh, that's something that is very important to keep in mind. And in an endless chain, for example, of events that are happening, you can think of it as... Uh, images that are supplied to us, it is very dif uh, difficult to tell event, uh, uh, to, to, to tell apart what is observation and what is uh, the sense of self, what is controlling and what is observing. So when there's always uh, uh, an alterna alternati alternating sequence of event and sense of control, event and sense of control and so on, we can't really say what is first. Is the event first and the control comes after, or is the controlling instance first and uh, the event comes comes after? And as we will see, uh, the sense of self is second and not first. Uh, at least that is one of the key observations that I want to uh, teach in this lecture. But I also want to explain this entire thing of self and how it comes to be even more with a few uh, recent developments in uh, computer science as an example, or robotics, or however you want to call it. And robots with sensors aren't too different from humans. They observe their environment through their sensors, like cameras or uh, other types of sensors. Every smartphone has, uh, for example, a a tilt sensor or something that is based on the uh, magnetic uh, field of the earth or something like that there are many kinds of sensors there are microphones which are essentially also sensors and every anything like that and uh, we can see that robots create some kind of self assumption when they are equipped with an artificial neural network or an ANN as it's called in computer science and we first deploy uh, deploy when, when first deployed when the robots are first deployed in a new environment with a pretty much clean and new neural network uh, they first learn a uh, sense of self they first learn the own control parameters of the limitations and everything else in essence they learn uh, an observer, a primitive sense of self, a primitive sense of separation, because that is what is always there. In each image or in each matrix of data that is supplied to the robot, there is always an observer. There are always the sensors that the robot has, the sensors in that, can, in that case. And that is not too different from humans. Uh, it totally makes sense as the robot and its control parameters are always part of the experience experience and it makes sense to introduce an artificial separation between all those things and while those uh, artificial neural networks are not really like humans or human neurons it is still a useful 
analogy that we can use to understand the entire process in more detail. Because uh, again, while the underlying structure is a different one, that does not mean that the entire process functions too differently. Because uh, artificial neural networks do learn, and they do learn in a very similar way, even though the underlying structure that holds the learned state is different. So as we can see, even robots learn a primitive sense of self, even though there might not be consciousness or anything like that involved. And we can move now from robots to humans, because parts of the human brain do very much behave like uh, artificial neural networks, or the other way around. <laughs> artificial neural networks are, of course, uh, modeled after the functioning of, of uh, real brains and real neurons as they occur in nature, even though the uh, neurons function in a very different way. And the human mind uh, always tries to find truth, uh, tries to accurately model uh, and predict the behaviors of things around us, as that is an evolutionary advantage. Uh, those creatures who could best predict, for example, if they are predators, where, they are, uh, where the prey would move next, had the best chances of survival because they were always well fed. So our brain is pretty much always trying to predict the future. It always tries to find the truth of things. It always tries to, well, well, model the future, and that requires an accurate uh, model of how everything works. So it always tries to find the truth. This is uh, pretty much pretty much always true. <laughs> and uh, when we get new sense inputs, the brain tries to abstract and infer and well, predict a self by similarity, for example. We always receive new things and we always try to generalize and abstract because generalized data is smaller than the totality of all available data. We cannot store everything all the time. That's, we don't have enough uh, memory <laughs> for that. So we have to pretty much abstract and, and generalize. And by that very process, we always also learn and infer the sense of self by the similarity, as the sense of self is always there. And humans only have self, interestingly, the, the sense of being, of a unit as, a, as an individual, from a certain age onwards, except for the underlying tendency. The underlying tendency of eye-making and mind-making is already there in a, in a toddler, for example. So that toddler will always create a sense of identity. That is programmed into the, into the mind, into the brain, into the biological programming of the, of the individual. And uh, can you remember, as an example, when you first felt like you, it's very hard to pinpoint usually. And the self could be called a mental model for control and, and separation, this and that, and that which must be protected, as an example. And we feel like the pilot <laughs> of this meat robot, and our point of view is pretty much always behind the eyes. And we strongly associate with the center of our vision. That is usually how humans work. It can be different. Uh, some uh, Asian cultures, for example, feel like they are situated in the heart, in the spiritual heart region, in the center of the chest. But that's not very common. Our logical thinking happens in the mind, and that is usually situated behind the eyes. But we can add, remove, or modify those mental models, like any other mental model too, that stands for the self. Our assumptions and hypotheses can be different. Once we confront our mind or our brain with conflicting data on the topic, then it always changes its underlying assumptions or hypotheses, because that is, again, a core function of the human mind. It always changes its models, its hypotheses, its, its, its assumptions about how the world works when confronted with conflicting evidence, as that was always an evolutionary advantage. So we are truth-seeking machines. Okay, now that we also know that, I want to come to a point uh, of the limitations of science. While we are certainly in line, while, while science is certainly in line with Buddhism on many aspects, there are also limitations when it comes to, to science overall. Because science uh, makes a few core assumptions, and I think I can say that as a scientist, that are not uh, very beneficial to finding truth in certain scenarios. But we will see what it, when it comes to that. And the first and uh, most a uh, fundamental, at least for the empirical uh, sciences, assumption is the objectivity ideal. The empirical science has such an ideal. It always tries to separate an external event from the observing instance, whatever that means. And the observer overall is usually ignored and not part of any experiment that is performed. And it is operated under the assumption that there is no observer at all, or that it is meaningless and does not in influence the, the process uh, at all. 
And uh, this makes sense because our emotions and our feelings usually influence the outcome of experiments. So what we want to be true is more likely to be true. And this is something that uh, scientists observed. So they try to rationalize it away uh, or remove our feelings and our emotions and our moods from an experiment so that we have a chance to get closer to the truth. The problem with that is, even if there are no emotions involved, the observer still uh, influences the process, which is something that we can very much discover at the quantum level, which leads to a very wonky behavior, as I like to call it. Uh, like the uh, observer is also always part of, uh, of a system. For example, an electron microscope always shoots electrons at uh, whatever it tries to observe, and thereby it influences the system. So the observer uh, already influences the system. And yeah, some of those, uh, well, behaviors lead to an interesting observations, namely that uh, a lot of processes suddenly uh, appear to be discrete, like uh, the, the energy packages uh, are quants, quantums. Uh, they come in certain discrete packages. And it's uh, hard to explain why that is that way. So there seems to be a, a jump from continuous to discrete at the, at the quantum level, where the observer suddenly matters again. And this could be very well a property of the observer, uh, which is something that we will uh, discuss later which is interesting. And one other thing that is very important is the sense horizon when it comes to humans. And this is my, might be one of the misunderstood and most misunderstood things out there. The Buddha said uh, 2,600 years ago that the entire universe, or monks, is in this fathom long body. That's about uh, two meters <laughs> in, in, in length. And everything we perceive with this body comes in through the six senses. Uh, the six senses are well, the eye, the nose, the ear, the, the sense of touch, uh, the, the sense of taste, and the mind, the thinking mind. In Buddhism, the thinking mind is also a sense, as the thoughts are more or less supplied to us, as we can uh, also observe in uh, well experiments where we try to predict our thinking, which is impossible. So it's more like a sense. We sense our thoughts. <laughs> and the important observation here is that light or sound or touch or anything first touches a sensory organ and then it is projected projected into space so first uh, if you like to think about it in the scientific model first some ray of light hits an object is reflected by the object and then it hits our eye and we create a mental impression of that of that event and that is true for all sensory organs so there's always a delay between those two things and uh, it's interesting when we apply that that entire way of thinking to our own body, which would mean that our body moves first, as an example, when we observe it through the eyes, and then the uh, sense of control is uh, is assumed afterwards. And uh, what lies beyond the senses, as an example, is forever unknown. It's unknowable by us, by the very nature of our senses. There is nothing uh, that could take us beyond this sense horizon, which is also very important. That would be like trying to find out what lies inside of a black hole or what lies outside of the universe. Our universe is very much dictated by our own senses. Uh, it is just that our sense of self creates this uh, external world for us. It assumes this external world and in the process it creates it. And everything overall, when, at least when it comes to Buddhism, is part of the arisen experience as a whole that is supplied to us by our sensory organs. Even external machinery <laughs> uh, is perceived through the eye. External test machinery that tries to uh, find out the truth about the universe, like the CERN uh, particle collider or anything like that. We perceive all the results that that machine makes through our eyes, through our sensory organs, which is very important to keep in mind. Because in essence, uh, it means that there's also always a component of observer or just observer <laughs> when it comes to comes to that. And arguments against free will will often be based on the, this assumed external that we can never ultimately know. And this leads to, or can lead to non-striving and nihilism. And that's why the Buddha condemned it strongly. And any thought about external is confined internally. It is a thought about external, which is very important to keep in mind. And this takes some time to, to sink in. It's not an easy thing to understand. And one could argue that it requires some insight. You can intellectually reason about that, but it's not very useful if you have not uh, known and seen it, as the Buddha called it. You have to see it in your own experience that it is like that. <laughs> 
then it makes a difference. Then it influences your behavior. The intellectual knowledge alone is never enough. Uh, this is why it's not enough to have love for wisdom, namely philosophy, practice philosophy. It is only good when you actually put the philosophy into practice. And you can compare the entire thing with uh, Plato's cave, which is a nice illustration of the entire process. In essence, there is a row of uh, prisoners here, and they can only see in front of them. There are shadows on the wall, and behind them someone performs uh, roadway theaters with puppets, and uh, they can only see the shadows of those things. Uh, and it is in, in the same way, our senses can only see the shadows of the real world, which is an assumption, uh, but never the real world, whatever that is. Uh, well, we can never perceive that. And this is one of the core observations in Buddhism, uh, that the world beyond the senses, the world of form, as the Buddha called it, is forever beyond us. We can never reach it, we can never attain it, we can only ever see shadows or thoughts of things, which is very important to keep in mind. But anyway, let us continue. <laughs> this is another comic from a German uh, uh, web comic creator uh, called Joshua Sauer, uh, and it's about beavers. It's a, obviously a joke. And uh, they argue <laughs> if uh, a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there who eats it. Oh, which is uh, just a parody on the famous uh, thought experiment. Uh, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody is there, has it already fallen? Which is kind of true, to be honest. If nobody is there to perceive that event, all you can say for sure is that the tree, if you have seen it before, was in one state, and when you see it again, uh, it is in another state. All the rest that happens is an extrapolation. It is something that our mind or our brain does. It tries to fill in the gaps. In reality, we only know two things for sure, namely the two sense impressions of the tree or the forest that we had before. All that happened in between is completely unclear to us. And again, you can try to clarify all of this uh, with the help of an experiment. And this one is rather simple. Imagine your eyes as cameras. What do you see? Is there a delay between the object and the mental picture that arises? Has it moved in the meantime while you were watching something else? And again, you can stop the video and try to do that and contemplate it a little bit and then come back to the answer of the experiment. But yeah, no matter what a camera and your eyes are a camera in a sense, can attend to, by its very nature, things that it sees are already there. <laughs> the camera just captures their state. The camera is not doing what it senses. It is subjected to whatever it sees. It can, well, only take pictures of things that are already there. And if you apply the same theme of perceiving or cognizing to your very own body through the uh, senses, through the eye or through any other sensory organ, the wrong order, namely the assumption of control, can get uprooted you undermine it by seeing that there is something more significant than that. And the already thereness is one of the perceptions that you can develop of a Nietzsche, namely that things do their stuff on their own, which is one of the core things that the Buddha taught. And unlike, uh, well, most people think, uh, ignorance, namely not perceiving parts of an image, is a process that requires mental capacity, as a sensory organ cannot just ignore certain things. A camera cannot ignore parts of a picture. You can remove them in post-processing steps, uh, but you cannot really uh, leave out something. And just like a camera cannot ignore parts of a photo it takes, it cannot, the eye cannot leave out images. If we do not perceive something, it is because we ignore it in a post-processing step of the mind. This is our tendency of ignorance. And this is something that is uh, at the core of pretty much all problems. We ignore the fact that things happen on their own. And as a result, we can maintain our assumption of control. And this is something that we try to uproot in Buddhism via meditation, via sense restraint, via all the other techniques that the Buddha pretty much, uh, pretty much uh, suggested to uproot all the wrong assumptions. And all of this is true for objective experiments too. We always assume an external and act like we are inside of this body, behind the eyes, and everything else is outside. It's always this and that. Always the internal and always the external. And there's always a sense of separation. And even, as mentioned before, particle accelerators are technically inside of experience. 
because whatever we have available is a sort of a particle accelerator. It is perceived through the eyes, whatever that means. And the eyes perceive whatever they wish. The eyes have a mind on their own, pretty much. Whenever the eye wants to look at a certain picture or at a certain part of a picture, it just does, unless one of the other sensory organs is stronger and experiences a, exerts a stronger pull on us than we look somewhere else. <laughs> and there is no ground for anything external to experience. It is forever a sense horizon, and most of science conveniently ignores this very fact. In philosophy it is very well known, I think it's called, uh, it's uh, researched or um, talked about in phenomenology, where people th talk about the, the uh, properties of the observer. But as we know from a wrong assumption, uh, everything can follow. This is one of the core observations of uh, propositional logic, which is very important. And uh, yeah, what we should keep in mind is that uh, when, whenever there are wrong assumptions, pretty much everything can, can follow from, from them. And this is a very important key observation. So we should very well be aware and be very aware very <laughs> of, of any type of wrong understanding that we have. Even the smallest bit of wrong understanding can totally ruin any uh, kind of, uh, yeah, of, of inference. Anything that is based on a wrong assumption is also wrong, very likely. But luckily, math and other uh, mind-based sciences uh, work model-based and without that assumption. So we can very much use those tools here in this lecture as an example. And uh, as we will later see, the Buddha used many of those tools. <laughs> but to illustrate the entire uh, process or the entire uh, fact that we are enclosed with our senses, within our senses, the Buddha gave us a simile. And I will present to you some of those throughout the, the lecture. And I will just read it to you and explain in the meantime. And, uh, and at one time, uh, someone asked the Buddha, is it possible, Bhante, which just means venerable sir or something like that, by traveling to know, see or reach the end of the world, where one is not born, does not grow old, does not die, does not pass away and get reborn. Say, friend, that by traveling one cannot no, see or reach the end of the world. In the past, Bhante, I was a seer named Oro, Orohitasa, son of uh, Boja, one possessing psychic potency, able to travel through the sky. And the wish arose in me, I will reach the end of the world by travel. And having a lifespan of 100 years, living for 100 years, I traveled for 100 years without pass uh, pausing, except to eat, drink, chew and taste, to defecate and to urinate, and to, uh, to, to dispel fatigue with sleep. Yet he did not uh, reach that goal. He died along the way. It is in this fathom-long body endowed with perception and mind that I proclaim the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the way leading to the cessation of the world. Essentially, and by the way, you can look up all the, all the suttas uh, that I present here by simply scanning the QR code or by searching the uh, respective number here uh, in the uh, Sutta Central uh, website, as an example, or when you have PDFs. Of, of the books of the Nikayas, then you can also look it up in there. The translations vary a bit, but overall it's uh, very similar most of the time. But what the Buddha points here at is that we cannot reach the end of the universe ever. Even if we create some kind of super fast spaceship, uh, what we see is never the, the external universe. It is always what our senses supply to us. We have no idea what lies behind our senses and we can never know that. And this is a fact that the Buddha is pointing here too, which is a very important fact because once we know that, we stop trying, kind of. Once we accept that fact and really let it sink in, then it makes a difference in our, in our experience. And that is a very important thing because otherwise uh, views or wrong views about such things can be a very subtle hindrance when it comes to spiritual progress. And we will see that later too, where the Buddha lies, uh, lays out all the different kinds of hindrances uh, in existence. And yeah, that brings us to the very important observation and uh, distinction between subject and object properties. And everything an experiment yields is only true if the assumption holds true, namely the assumption of isolation, the assumption of externalness and all those other things. And observed properties, most of the time, could be both. Characteristics of an external system or an external environment or characteristics of our senses. We can never say uh, if something is either something that our uh, that is dictated by the limits of our senses or if there is something external going on. As an example, if our eyes just snap 30 pictures uh, every 
every second or something like that, then uh, it kind of limits what we can perceive. So it might create a, the mind might create a, a moving sequence of pictures out of uh, out of those pictures. But in the end, there is still very much a limit going on because we only have so much power of the senses in a sense. And this is the same holds true for every sensory organ that we have. And in essence, it could always be both. That limitation could be due to the external systems that we observe, or that limitation could be due to, well limitations of the senses. And especially at the quantum level, effects make more sense as a, a property of the observer. And one example would be the colorless wave, wave function as soon as something is knowable or spooky action in the distance as, as an example. Uh, because we always know uh, both objects as an example. So it, it seems to be more a property of our mind uh, and the, the perceptual organs than a property of the external that we just assume. And we can never really know. We can try to experiment with it, but it will always be confined uh, to thought that, that appear in our mind, thought about the external world. So it's about everything else. And Buddhism includes and transcends the science of the observer, which is uh, phenomenology, as I understand it. But yeah, let us continue. Uh, one more thing of uh, importance is uh, a word of warning. Uh, and that's what Thomas Sowell called the scientist's conceit, I believe. And in essence, it means that scientists and intellectuals in general have a very strong conceit of knowing it all, uh, me included. I'm a scientist and uh, I'm, I'm usually quite good at what I do. And from that, pretty much automatically by the human nature, results a certain type of conceit. A person who is good at one thing usually assumes uh, greatness at everything or the ability to be great at everything. That might even be true if you put uh, the same amount of work into other areas, but most people do not. They just assume to be great at everything despite not putting in the work. And we usually never question our, our axioms about reality as it really is, and thus we end up with false uh, false inferences, false uh, facts that, that do not hold true. And Thomas Sowell uh, documented this phenomenon very well. And I would strongly encourage you to restrain your ego, at least to a certain point, and uh, yeah, to actually find out the truth of the matter. <laughs> because oftentimes we just misunderstand based on double meanings of words, for example. It is not rare that a scientist would say that people have no idea what they are talking about, simply because they use words in a different way and they never question that, which is uh, something that can lead to great misunderstandings and yeah that's something that should be avoided in my opinion and many buddhists for example are extremely rational and extremely critical and often at uh, times we have biases and misconceptions not them which was a very hard pill to swallow for me and i was humbled in many ways when i tried to dive into the entire topic it turned out to be much more complex and had much much more depth than i had initially anticipated but yeah let us now come to one of the summary uh, slides for this presentation and this one is rather important but now we list the tools that we need for later that uh, come from science one could argue but the buddha uh, for example used them implicitly and we will use them actively because we know those words we know those tools by heart in modern society and one of those things is that we would like to use logical in inference systems and axiom systems systems of logic uh, implicit assumptions uh, as an example uh, from something wrong, everything can follow us, for example, an observation that is very important. And that observation is one of the key things that uh, we use. We like to avoid wrong assumptions. We like to avoid to base our logic on something that is wrong. So we try to really figure out something that holds true all the time, which is very important. And the next thing that comes to mind is a non-temporal system of logic and cause and effect. Uh, which is something that is very foreign to most of us because the Buddha always talked about non-temporal logic. He talked about things that depend on each other but not temporally. So while we sit here, we can only do so because we also have a body and we can only perceive that because we have functioning senses. But all those things are there at the same time. The body is a basis for our senses is there, our senses are there, the images of our senses are there, feelings are there, all those things are there at the same time. It's not a quick succession of steps or anything like that, how it's often portrayed. All those things are there at the same time. And we also need, in the very same context, uh, a distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions. Because sometimes you can remove one component from a logical equation, as an example, and the result will change. 
And it's very important to keep that in mind, because that is what the process of dependent origination pretty much relies upon, which is one of the core teachings of the Buddha. And the next thing that comes to mind is a proof by contradiction or an indirect proof where we, for example, uh, via the non-self experiment that we just did, try to lead our experiment to a contradiction so that the mind tries to correct the mistake it previously made. And uh, what is also important is a bit of knowledge about the encoding of information overall, namely the presence of an absence. That is something that we can't really um, do with computers. Uh, some programming languages like Haskell can do it because they are in a sense lazy. So you can write down an expression that represents something that is eternal or something that is infinite or something like that. But at some point it has to be uh, evaluated. And that's when the uh, infinity or eternity breaks down pretty much. And then man mind maps or mental models are also a tool that we use to illustrate uh, complex ideas. And then we have the A-B tests or studies, um, which are subjective experiments, which is very important to keep in mind. And I guess I will point that out uh, quite often because a study is an idealized A-B test. We try to isolate certain factors while we never can while we can never really do that because the observer is always there and as we know the observer influences the system so we can never really fully isolate uh, the two variables that we try to test uh, in an experiment uh, famous examples of that are uh, for example the, the study showed that there are lots of people in in finland i believe uh, that break their bones and uh, they also observed that uh, those people in finland drink a lot of milk and thus they concluded that milk makes your bones brittle and uh, that's why they break their bones so often which is uh, a correlation in essence they observed two things at once uh, it was a simultaneous presence of two things but that does not mean that those things cause each other which is very important that's one thing that the mind immediately jumps to to uh, conclusions about one thing causing the other thing when they happen all at once which is not true for example, the movement of our body and the same simultaneous presence of a feeling does not mean that the feeling is of the body or something like that. The feeling could also just happen at the same time, which is something that we also analyze in later lectures, uh, which is very interesting. And the result of this uh, study in Finland is that, uh, yeah, Finland is full of mountains <laughs> and it's cold there and uh, people just fall often because it's slippery and cold and full of hills. It does not have to do anything with the milk. So we have to be very careful when just observing two things at once. Because more often than not, or very often at least, it's not that one thing causes the other. It's just things happening at the same time. And the last thing that we use for later, or already have used, are artificial neural networks. Simply to uh, model and describe the functioning of the human brain and our logic so that we can uh, get, a, get an intuitive understanding of how the self works, why the self works, how it comes to be, etc. It's always easier to accept a certain piece of information when we have a model uh, that uh, describes such a thing in a different way. Then it's not too far-fetched that other explanations could exist too. But yeah, let us now come to the most important points or to the key points of chapter zero. And the first one is that many mathematical tools have been implicitly used by the Buddha. He discovered them and used them way before uh, we came up with those tools in science, which is rather interesting and which uh, really points to the, to the genius of the Buddha. Then uh, meditation studies confirm many of the benefits of meditation, but they cannot be trusted 100%, simply because we cannot truly isolate uh, one thing from another in an A-B test, which is a study, pretty much. A good study is uh, like, like that. It's an experiment. And another thing that comes to mind is that the human influence is one influence of choice or action or upheld choice, inclination, however you want to call it. The human influence is, a, is an influence of karma, of kamma. And it's also important to keep that in mind because uh, practitioners tend to get... Uh, confused when it comes to the truth of non-self as an example uh, they suddenly think that uh, that there's no free will at all that all things are determined that it does not make sense to focus on anything or anything like that which is not true buddhism concerns itself with the nature of things and precise logic and you should always be <laughs> kind of very when it comes to making conclusions based on still faulty logic because that is how we start we start with complete misunderstanding of reality as it is, of experience as it is, and then we slowly correct it if we start to practice meditation correctly, if we start to practice Buddhism correctly. And the truth of non-self, for example, can be 
tested in a limited sense in scientific experiments. Of course, you still have to make the experiment uh, experience, and the scientific experiment is not enough, but still, it can help you get started, because suddenly there might be something out there that is worthwhile investigating if science points to, well, more research is needed. And people have a very intuitive trust in science, and not very much so anymore uh, in, in Buddhism or other religions, which is a rather new thing. It was different in the past, where people had a lot of trust in religion, but not necessarily in crazy alchemists or <laughs> any, anyone else who tried to figure out truth. And uh, the last thing that I want to point out is that there are many phrasings or isomorphisms for the Buddha's teachings. I just chose one that appeals to academic types, that is very logical and that really helps understand the message on a logical level. That does not mean it's the only uh, way of expressing the Buddha's teachings. It's just the words that point to what the Buddha said. And words are like fingers to the moon, as I came often said. They are useful, but they do not... Uh, yeah, they, they do not contain the truth, they just point to the truth, which is very important to keep in mind, because otherwise we can really misunderstand each other, because words always have a different meaning for each of us. And what the one meaning for one person is not the same meaning for another person. And uh, we will uh, analyze that problem in detail in one of the following chapters. But the next chapter will be on uh, the motivational aspects and the benefits of meditation. And this might be interesting for all those people who do meditation for self-improvement benefits, but later might realize that there is more to it and that you can even transcend the self, which is a rather worthwhile endeavor. Anyway, let us now come to the question slide. Uh, as always, I like to encourage you to ask your questions down below so that we can discuss them in the last part of the lecture, where I try to collect all the questions that people might have so that everyone can benefit from them, so that we have a good collection of questions concerning the material that I have presented. But yeah, so feel free to comment below. I might answer before that, but I will also uh, answer in, in video format, at least is that the idea behind it. But yeah, now to the bibliography. If you want to look at some things in detail, you can always pause the video and then try to look up all the studies that have been presented here. There are a lot of them. Some of those links contain uh, study collections and not just uh, individual studies, which is also important to keep in mind. But yeah, you can just look them up for yourself. And there's a myriad of other uh, studies available that you can also check out if you are skeptical towards the benefits of meditation. But I really want to encourage you to just see for yourself and practice what the Buddha taught. In essence, he gave us a path, which is just a list of experiments and a list of uh, things that we should do to see for ourselves. That's what he did. It was a very uh, scientific approach in that regard. He gave us the tools to see for ourselves, but we have to see for ourselves. <clears throat> he said in one of the suttas that he can only point the way, but you have to go the way. Uh, when a person asked why some people, after hearing the Buddha's teachings, become enlightened and some do not. And uh, then he compared it with a wanderer that asked for directions. And the Buddha said, yeah, that, that village, that town is in that direction. But then the wanderer goes in another direction. That's not on the Buddha. <laughs> His teachings are still correct. But if you do not put them into practice, namely go the way, go along the path that he laid out, then you will not experience the results. And the results can be very much experiment, uh, experienced. A lot of people nowadays will, uh, will vouch for that. But again, it only really matters when you can put them into practice. But yeah, uh, this is pretty much it for today. Well, this is the entire lecture. Here's a contact slide. If you want to, you can uh, support me, for example, on Patreon. If you find uh, what I do here uh, valuable, you can also join the Dhamma Hub Discord, where we discuss uh, early Buddhism. Other people are obviously also welcome for discussion, but uh, what we mainly practice there is just just that, as we find it the most, uh, yeah, the most direct approach, the most trustworthy approach, approach, and that what seems to work. And there's also a link to, to books on Amazon. But yeah, anyway, this is pretty much it for today. Uh, I thank you very much for, for watching the lecture and for giving uh, the giving me, me your attention. If you know anyone who might profit from uh, those lectures, feel free to link it to them. And yeah, maybe they can also enjoy what I present here. There's a lot of work when, uh, that went into this lecture. But yeah, and uh, in the meantime, next lecture will be on all the benefits and all the advantages of meditation. And it also might be split into two because uh, the slide deck in that regard is rather big. But yeah, I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day and goodbye.